Our panel on data collection and effective public policy is facilitated by Ian Goldberg. He's the Canada Research Chair in Privacy Enhancing Technologies and Professor in the Sheridan School of Computer Science at the University of Waterloo. Ian, I'll hand the rest over to you and uh, have fun. Okay, thank you. So uh, welcome everybody to the last session of uh, this year's CPI annual event. So uh, I will briefly introduce our uh, four panelists today. Kelly O'Hearn is a Senior Advisor Promotion in the Business Advisory Directorate of the Office of the Privacy Commissioner of Canada. Lyle King is the Director of Risk Mitigation Programs at the Canadian Centre for Cybersecurity. Nicolas Papernon is Assistant Professor at the University of Toronto in uh, Electrical and Computer Engineering and in Computer Science. And Anindya Sen is Professor of Economics at the University of Waterloo and also the Associate Director of the Waterloo Cybersecurity and Privacy Institute, CPI itself. So each of our uh, speakers will uh, present kind of some, an opening uh, statement for about 12 minutes, and then we will uh, start the discussion both uh, with myself asking questions of the panelists, the panelists asking questions of each other, and then we'll open up to the audience and you all can ask uh, questions of everyone. So let's take it away. I believe uh, Kelly is going first. So please go ahead. Thank you very much, Ian, and thank you everyone for uh, sharing your Friday before a long weekend uh, with us talking about privacy. Uh, it's a very exciting topic for those of us I know who are in the industry. Uh, so my name is Kelly O'Hearn. I am a senior advisor with the Business Advisory Directorate uh, with the OPC. Uh, for anyone who doesn't know who the OPC is, uh, they are an, we are an agent of parliament. So we are independent of government, uh, but we do provide advice and bring issues to the attention of parliament. Uh, some of the things that we do at the OPC is we oversee compliance with the Privacy Act and uh, PIPIDA, which is the Personal Information Protection and Electronic Documents Act. Uh, so basically, federal departments, we look at how they manage personal information, and then we do the same with the commercial private sector. And so we do investigations and audits. And what I actually do is the other side, which is promotion. So proactively giving advice and recommendations to businesses on their privacy management programs. Uh, and so that is the work that we do. Uh, a little bit uh, just on what you would need to know about PIPIDA if you're not familiar with. We're going to focus a little bit more on PIPIDA than uh, the Privacy Act today. Uh, so just going to, I'm just here to give a background on what that act is, what it looks like, and we're going to talk a little bit about some of the new changes that have been proposed, and I know that my other panelists will be going into that in a little more detail. Uh, so first of all, when it comes to federal privacy legislation, uh, with PIPIDA, it is an act that was passed in 2000, uh, put into force fully in 2001. And it is an act that applies to any organization that collects, uses, or discloses personal information in the course of commercial activity. Uh, it can also relate to federal works, undertakings, or businesses, uh, and the personal information of their employees. So banks, airlines, organizations like that. With PIPIDA, uh, the North Star or the public purpose of PIPIDA is to support and promote uh, electronic commerce by protecting personal information that is collected, used, and disclosed in certain circumstances by providing for the use of electronic means to communicate or record information or transaction. And basically, we're looking to enhance Canadians' control over their personal information. PIPIDA has within it 10 what we call fair information principles. Um, and I'm going to talk about, I'll touch on what each of the 10 are, uh, but focusing on a couple of them as uh, there's a few that I think require a little bit more discussion and conversation than others. Uh, so within, this, within the scope of PIPIDA, the 10 in fair information principles are accountability, identifying purposes, consent, limiting collection, limiting use, disclosure, and retention, accuracy, safeguards, openness, individual access, and challenging compliance. 
Some of those are very straightforward uh, when we talk about things like identifying purposes. You know, what is the purpose for why you are collecting information? I think a lot of, uh, uh, it seems like a very simple idea, um, but one that we encourage businesses to do to prevent the over collection of personal information. Uh, basically within PIPIDA, the main cornerstone is consent. Uh, and you'll hear a lot perhaps discussed on how do we, how do we process information without consent in a digital realm where you know, we're looking to advance things like artificial intelligence, making things easier, making things more portable from one organization to another, when the federal privacy legislation relies very heavily on consent. And it's certainly doable, but currently it is something that businesses should be considering while they are trying to make their processes more efficient. So speaking just quickly to the idea of consent as that is the cornerstone and sort of the main focus of PIPIDA, uh, we talk about consent needing to be meaningful. And what that means is that consent is considered valid if it is reasonable to expect that individuals understand the nature, purposes, and consequences of why they're providing, of what information it is that they're providing. So information, so individuals should be made aware of where their information is being held. Uh, if it, especially if it is not in Canada, who has access to it, what it's being used for, and they should have uh, some information about how they can go about asking questions about their information and what businesses are doing with it. Now, we do within PIPIDA, although it is a cornerstone to have consent, it is not, uh, we don't want to promote the idea that just because somebody consents to giving their personal information that that's always appropriate. Uh, so we have also developed at the OPC some guidelines around appropriate purposes. So even if somebody provides consent, that personal information should, o should only be provided and collected used and disclosed for purposes that a reasonable person would consider appropriate for the circumstances. And so we have a series of no-go zones. Uh, if you provide information, even with consent, that is going to be used for illegal purposes if companies are using it in a way that they know is going to be harmful to the individual, uh, those are reasons that even with consent, the OPC would find that an inappropriate use of data. So we do still have some protections in mind when it comes to uh, the collection of information, even in a consent situation. Some of the challenges around the consent clause is finding innovative and creative ways to ensure consent. So a lot of people, uh, what you will see when you sign up for a website or you work with an organization, is you'll see a checkbox and you'll see a line that says, and I, I think if you, I talk about this, I think everyone in the room is going to nod their heads and think of an, an example. Um, check the box and if you, if you sign it, if you check this box here, you've read our privacy policy, there's a link to it at the bottom, and that's all you're provided with. And then you're expected to go into a document that can be thousands of pages or thousands of words long, uh, written at a very high academic level. And the assumption is you've checked the box, you provided your consent. That would not be considered meaningful consent if the individual wouldn't have reasonably able to understood what it is that they were consenting to. So what, a lot of times what I do when I work with businesses is we challenge them to find new ways to explain to the public what it is that you're doing with their information and to give them the control that they need to be comfortable and establish that trust in providing their personal information. Most businesses are not bad actors. Most businesses are looking to provide a service legitimately to the public, but it's important that they understand that the public has the right to know what their information, what their personal information is that they're providing, how it's being used, and who has access to it. Um, so we're we always challenge businesses to consider the individual perspective when they are looking at ways of uh, implementing their policies or, or providing services. Uh, the other, the other uh, principle that I think we talk about a lot in this realm is safeguarding. Um, and this is where things like encryption levels, cybersecurity, uh, data breaches, this is where you'll see a lot of this information. 
Within PIPIDA, it states that all personal information must be protected against lost, uh, lost, theft, or unauthorized access. And that's a pretty, pretty broad, uh, pretty broad principle. How you achieve that and the degree that individual businesses need to go to in order to achieve that really does depend on the sensitivity of the information that a business is holding. So if a business is only collecting a name and an email address, you still have a requirement to protect that information. It is personal information, but the degree to which you have to protect that information, the levels you have to take would differ from an organization that's collecting medical health information, financial information, social insurance numbers, information that if it were breached, uh, that would potentially cause some serious harm to the individual. We also look at safeguards from not just a technological standpoint, but from a physical and an organizational standpoint. So it's more than just having a certain level of encryption on your data. We're looking at if you hold physical documents, having things like locked drawers, having security access codes to buildings, um, and looking at organizationally, you know, doing audits on who has access to information. When people leave an organization, is somebody going through and changing those access levels? So safeguarding is a lot bigger than just a technological standpoint, but certainly in a digital environment and as the virtual market expands, you know, the technological me measures are absolutely very important. Um, and we also deal with uh, any kind of breach of data. So a breach being the loss or unauthorized access to personal information. Uh, a lot of times breaches are not due to technological issues. A lot of times it's more organizational. Um, or a matter of human error. So somebody mailing the wrong document or emailing the wrong information, somebody having access or, or looking at a file they shouldn't be um, or taking information uh, and using it in an inappropriate way. So it's not even necessarily that somebody's hacked your system, which is certainly a threat, but by and large, a lot of our data breaches come from uh, more organizational issues. So we really do encourage businesses to look at safeguarding from a holistic aspect. Now, some of you may be aware uh, that there is some new legislation that has been proposed, uh, which is called, it's called currently Bill C-27, which is the Digital Charter Implementation Act of 2022. Uh, it is available at the Parliament uh, call.ca website, and I encourage people to read uh, what this bill is proposing, but basically it's looking to enact three separate pieces of legislation. So the first being the Consumer Privacy Protection Act, which will replace PIPIDA. Um, and that gives the Office of the Privacy Commissioner some additional powers. Uh, it will also provide some additional definitions on information that currently don't exist in PIPIDA. It's a bit of a restructuring away from having the principles uh, laid out as a schedule and really embedding them into the act. Uh, we also have the Personal Information and Data Protection Tribunal Act, which will establish a tribunal that if you disagree with a decision made by the OPC, uh, that will be, you will be able to go to a tribunal and a different party will look at that decision and, make, and render a decision whether that uh, recommendation was appropriate or not. It's a little bit different than the current structure, which is if you don't agree with decisions made by the OPC, you have to go to the Federal Court of Canada, which is a very lengthy, time-consuming, and expensive process. Uh, so this will sort of shorten that a little bit. And finally, the Artificial Intelligence and Data Act, which is sort of our first stab in Canada at creating some regulation for the use and collection of artificial intelligence, how that, some regulation as to how that's going to work. Uh, but it is, it is sort of an attempt to, to look at that market, that technology, and see if there's some regulations that can be put into place. Now, the first reading of this bill was passed, what occurred in June of 2022. It is still very new, so we do not know at this point what this bill will eventually look like and how these acts will be changed. Um, if you understand anything about how bills are passed in government, they have to go through several readings at the House of Commons and Senate levels before they actually become law. And then there's a time period that it actually becomes uh, put into force. But at the OPC, we're currently reviewing this bill and those three acts. Uh, the Privacy Commissioner will be releasing his public statement and public comment on those acts hopefully very soon. Uh, so I would encourage everyone, if you are interested in this, read the acts, uh, look, at, look at what 
we're proposing moving forward. And then pay attention to the OPC's website, which is priv.gc.ca, uh, because those public opinions will be published there. And as well, uh, any other public statements we have about law reform will be available there. And I think that will be it for me for now. I will provide some additional information for context uh, to the audience. So I'll have a, I'll have a little slide together, a slideshow put together that I'll share. Um, but uh, for me, that's really all I have to present for today. And thank you very much. Great, thank you, Kelly. Uh, Lyle, you're up next. All right, you can hear me okay? No. Excellent, thank you very much. Uh, great pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is Lyle King. I'm the director of the Risk Mitigation Program at the uh, Canadian Centre for Cybersecurity. Couldn't be there in person. I'm an uh, UW uh, alumni, so uh, disappointed I couldn't be there with you today. And I just will note in my office right now, there's some window cleaners coming down slowly. So if there's some, a little bit of noise, I apologize for that, but we'll just continue. So just a, a quick bit of background. Um, so the Cyber Centre is part of the Communications Security Establishment which is Canada's national cryptologic organization. So our, and our mission really is to do effectively two things. One is providing information, that is the intelligence mission of the organization. And we do that in response to government of Canada requirements, intelligence requirements. And then we also protect information. So that's the defensive side of what we do. So I personally have worked in the intelligence side of this organization for uh, over 20 years. Uh, looking at a variety of, of threat actors, uh, either from the counterintelligence, counterterrorism, but more recently into state actors in the cyber threat domain. So I'm going to be touching on the, the cyber threat component of that really today. And recently moved over to the defensive side, working for Cyber Center and Risk Mitigation. So through my career, I've dealt with data collection, uh, data protection, uh, and privacy issues for, for many, many years. Uh, but I think with a very particular context. So I think on my, my brief discussion will kind of come at it from that particular context, if you will. So what I'd like to touch on in, in my introductory remarks are really just touching on a little bit of just the increasing nature of the online world, whether that's government, academia, or private sector. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the threat landscape, what we see uh, from the cyber center in terms of threats, what that means to privacy. Then I'll touch on just a couple of data breach examples uh, and why really, you know, for us, it's cybersecurity and protection uh, of privacy go hand in hand, quite frankly. And I'll touch briefly then on some of the services that Cyber Center does provide. So in terms of that context and increasingly online uh, world, and you'd be hard pressed to find any organization that's not had to pivot and change the business model, uh, you know, thanks to, to COVID. And we've been in this now for well over two years. Um, but a lot of people having to switch modes, working from home with a little, uh, you know, little warning and notification just to maintain productivity rates. So, you know, we've seen restaurants do it, move to online ordering mo uh, modes. We've seen certainly universities have done it. My son personally hated online classes. I don't know about the rest of you, but I think he enjoyed that personal interaction. And, you know, even, even for CSE, we've had to, to change the way we do business through that period. It's been a matter, quite frankly, of survival right, um, since the onset of the pandemic. And for us in this organization, where we often rely on uh, secure networks, uh, data separated networks that don't connect to the internet, it's been a very challenging time for us. But there's components of our business that we do in an unclassified space. So we've had to rely on shifting things over to cloud infrastructure, deploying remote secure access for employees. And we found ways to sort of work in this environment. So it's very much a technological challenge, but also a cultural one. And I think that's an important point. We're not just talking about technology here. We're talking about a mindset that people have had to shift into. People in our organization that used to like heavily secure zones to work in, suddenly not working in those spaces. People bringing work at home. How do you manage that data? You know, how do you, how do you deal in that world? I mean, that's a really, really important thing. I think the cultural aspect of it. So, you know, whether it's government, academia, private sector, we've certainly seen uh, a lot of, of shift and that shift will stay. I mean, some return back to office, yes, but there's gonna be a hybrid work environment for some time to come. So, you know, our concern from a cyber center perspective uh, certainly is the fact that with the shifts half, having happened so rapidly, uh, we've done it with taking some shortcuts, you know, and that's the fact, like people have tried to shift for business survival reasons, of course, but at the same time, maybe at the expense of some security, you know, in terms of the way that they manage their data and their connectivity back to their, 
their, their headquarters and their organizations. So just something that we have to acknowledge it's been an issue. As we return back, we need to rethink, really examine our security postures as well and how we're, how we're doing. So I'll just pivot over quickly to sort of the threat landscape and uh, what that means in terms of privacy. So, um, you know, the Cyber Center does produce every couple of years a national cyber threat assessment. Uh, describing the threat environment, touches on things like online foreign influence, threats to uh, public uh, safety, physical safety, security fraud, extortion, all this kind of stuff, and does touch on privacy issues as well. So we'll have an updated one coming up pretty soon. The last one was 2020, so uh, watch out for it. We usually publish these things on our, our websites. But in terms of like the top lines, uh, what that cyber threat landscape looks like for Canada, and this will be you know relevant and I think not necessarily news for you, but we see that certainly cybercrime, you know, continues to be the cyber threat that's most likely to affect Canadians and Canadian organizations. And it's most certainly going to continue. You know, we're going to see online fraud attempts to steal personal, uh, financial and, and corporate information. It's not going to change. It's going to probably increase if we, as we've increased that, that threat surface ourselves. Um, certainly ransomware directed against Canada probably continue to target very large enterprises uh, and critical infrastructure providers because uh, they cannot tolerate, you know, sustained disruptions to their businesses and they're willing to pay, quite frankly. That's, that's what these individuals are looking for, uh, a quick payout. But, you know, it's sad, but many Canadian victims will continue to give in to these demands due to the severe cost of losing businesses. And that's just the reality. But while you know cybercrime is like the most likely threat, uh, we can't ignore there are, of course, state-sponsored programs that, that pose a great strategic threat uh, to Canada as well. So we do know, we watch, we observe, and we see state-sponsored actors uh, developing their cyber capabilities and looking at things like looking to aim to disrupt things like Canadian critical infrastructure. You know, our assessment is it's unlikely this would happen in the absence of international hostilities, but Sadly, you don't have to look too far to see how rapidly that can change in today's world. So we've seen a lot of things happening in Ukraine and Russia and, and you know, the spillover that that can have. Russia is targeting UK and Ukraine from a cyber perspective. You know, the interconnected uh, networks there, uh, it's, it's a problem for everybody. So we see this as a, a very uh, dangerous space strategically, right? We watch that quite, quite a lot. And certainly state-sponsored actors, aside from looking at, uh, you know, critical infrastructure and uh, deploying capabilities against those. And again, we've seen them use that actively in Ukraine. They will continue certainly to conduct things like commercial espionage uh, against Canadian businesses, against academia uh, and governments as well to steal Canadian intellectual property and proprietary information. Um, and certainly a last one to point out is online influence, uh, foreign influence campaigns, which we've seen uh, ongoing, uh, not just during election periods, but it's often quite referred to during an election cycle, but it's a never present thing. You know, I'm certainly speaking from a person who's lived in Ottawa for a long time. We had, uh, you know, convoys here that was picked up in uh, not just national media, but international media. And there was some concern that that would have been um, highlighted and stoked, if you will, by uh, foreign adversaries as well. In terms of cyber threats that face individuals, uh, again, foreign influence is certainly a thing. You know, Canada's not necessarily uh, the number one target of foreign adversaries, but we live in a country that's so tightly intertwined uh, in terms of a media uh, ecosystem with the U.S. that there's a lot of spillover. So what's hitting the U.S. space hits our space as well. So it's an ever-present theme that we know will continue, and uh, Canadians will certainly be exposed to that sort of issue. There's certainly the thought that could be more, there can be more threats to uh, physical safety and security when we just consider the amount of internet connected devices, whether that's vehicles, uh, smart home security systems, uh, medical devices, all being integrated into day-to-day -day life. They provide vectors for adversaries to, to take advantage of. So targeting these devices really can have impacts beyond just cyber. It's like the real world threat uh, for us. So we look at those issues too. And of course, fraud and extortion, like I've noted, uh, cybercrime is going to be an ever-present issue. We certainly see them, uh, for example, actors taking, uh, taking advantage of, of current events. Uh, in the last few years, certainly, a lot of cyber threat actors developed COVID-19 related uh, content, for example, to trick victims into uh, clicking on malicious links and the like to download malware and then infect systems. So it's there, you know, we're in a situation where we have uh, an ever increasing presence online, a necessity to do so to survive economically. And at the same time, tools and capabilities for cyber criminals are really becoming 
uh, much more readily available and sophisticated. So it's a dangerous space that we operate in. So, you know, in terms of those uh, threats to privacy, I'll just touch on a couple of, of data breaches, uh, you know, in terms of examples. But generally speaking, you know, as Canadians generate, restore, uh, share more personal information online, the data becomes vulnerable to cyber threat actors. Uh, as I said, the growth of internet connected devices has added uh, not just to the presence of these things, but the amount of data that is collected simply on Canadians as well. And as we see advances in things like data science, artificial intelligence, it makes it difficult to maintain data anonymity. There's tools and methods and means now where you can de-anonymize what previously was anonymous data sets and link them together. So it's a, it's a very interesting space right now. Um, and again, certainly Canadians have become victims of large data breaches. I'll, I'll touch on two right now very quickly. Um, last fall, there was a significant cyber incident that impacted the critical uh, IT system supporting uh, healthcare providers in Newfoundland and Labrador, for example. Hard to fathom, you know, why people would, would target healthcare, but that's what cyber criminals do. They know it's susceptible. They know they get potentially an easy payout. But this, this attack resulted in a lot of issues, right? Patient appointments being canceled for various things from like blood work to, to cancer care. Um, in March 2022, um, the governor of Newfoundland and Labrador announced that they had done an investigation. Uh, they concluded that over 200,000 files were taken from a network uh, on the IT environment. Uh, and this included things like medical diagnoses, information on medical procedures, medical history of individuals, personal information, you know. Um, and it's crucial for us as a cyber center to be able to work with and engage with them to help them through these issues. So uh, I point to this example as well, because I think Newfoundland and Labrador Health Authority responded in a very positive way. They, they fared better in terms of managing it because the degree to which they are willing to work uh, with us in this space. And that comes from like sharing information, uh, us getting in to help them clean up their networks and advise, provide uh, advice and guidance, et cetera. And they were quite transparent too. They were very open with what they had uh, uh, we're dealing with they they kept information on the, the internet to keep citizens informed uh, developments of what was happening in their investigation as well so i think dedication to transparency uh, helps foster trust certainly with assist with canadian cit citizens uh, as well from our perspective their ability and, and commitment to work with the cyber center and then briefly one other there was in 2021 and many of these of course but uh, Canada Post announced it had been a victim as well of a malware attack when one of its suppliers uh, that managed ship shipping manifest data uh, had had its systems compromised. So at the end of the day, uh, you know, there's a huge amount of data uh, that was exposed, something in, a, the, the, something in the vicinity of uh, information on uh, 950,000 uh, Canadians seem to have taken mostly names and addresses, but some other personal information uh, included in there as well. So those things you can see, sometimes it doesn't take much to have a significant impact on, on, the, on, on the data breach and the privacy of Canadians. And nobody's really you know, susceptible. Nobody's 100% proof uh, from these sorts of attacks. So I'll just quickly note, you know, in terms of Cyber Center, what our role is in this space. You know, we're there to, to provide services to the public. Um, we do incident handling and support. So we provide uh, incident reports. We analyze suspected malware sets like we did with uh, the Newfoundland and uh, Labrador Health Authority. We provide uh, threat intelligence in terms of alerts, threat briefings. We share uh, automated uh, feeds of indicators of compromise so that uh, network uh, providers can, network uh, managers can, can incorporate that into their defensive posture. Uh, we engage in community building. So we have, we look at a bunch of different sectors, right? We don't just work with government, but we look at that the health sector, finance, transportation, telecommunications, we build communities of interest and trust to share information on threats and, and, and share best practices on how to respond to protect data networks. Um, advice and guidance, same, it can be very general from our website, very, very tailored to specific issues and incidents. And then cyber defensive services. So from a government perspective, we have sensors on Government of Canada networks to be able to see uh, anomalous behaviors, uh, et cetera. And we can deploy those onto other critical infrastructure spaces uh, using, you know, we, we get into agreements with other entities, uh, non-disclosure agreements where we can help them secure their networks and provide monitoring services. So a lot we, that we do here. And I'll throw this one out to, to Kelly from the Office uh, of the Privacy Commissioner. Uh, CSE did meet as well with uh, the Privacy Commissioner back in um, uh, December of last year ahead of the Beijing Olympics, uh, really to talk about some of the risks associated uh, to the, the, the mobile 
uh, IT threat, if you will, to, to Canadian athletes that were heading to Beijing. And, you know, the context uh, is maybe a little less tense now than it was then, but we certainly had issues with China uh, with respect to Meng Wanzhou and the two Michaels who were kidnapped in that. So we, we do this, uh, this sort of thing quite frequently. So I see Ian popping up, which means my time is up. Um, I would just like to thank you. I'm happy to talk a little bit more about what we do in the context of uh, data protection and privacy uh, from uh, uh, supporting Canada, but also Government of Canada and the public. So uh, with that, I'll close off. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lyle. And Nicholas, you're up next. Thank you, Ian. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit more technically uh, on the different definitions of what it means to have a privacy preserving analysis today. Um, so let me start with a little um, sort of case of prior definitions that have been proposed, such as uh, de-identification. So there has been a lot of uh, discussion with the previous speakers of de-identification. And the idea here is that we're going to try to process the data uh, to remove what is considered uh, to identify particular individuals. So this could mean replacing uh, features by wildcards or even just generalizing some of the features. A very common example is if you have uh, actually collected the age of individuals, you could imagine that you're going to process the data in, in a way that now you group individuals by age bins. And so now you don't report directly the age of the person, but uh, instead the bin uh, in which their age falls. And so this, this is some, some example processing steps that people use to uh, de-identify uh, data. And so what I, my first point here today is, is to really highlight that these techniques based on de-identification and their definitions like anonymity, where you would uh, require that each record is at least indistinguishable with uh, K minus one other records in the data set, for instance. The, the main limitation of these techniques is that they're contextual. So you cannot reason about the risk that individuals are facing without making some assumptions about what possible adversaries will know about the individuals uh, which the data is about. And so we have seen difficulties related to this contextual nature of the definition in defining what are identifiers, which features really identify individuals. And some features are called quasi-identifiers uh, because they might uh, be, for instance, attributes that are available to the adversary. And so when we reason about what we need to remove from the original data set, if the adversary has access to additional data, then this reasoning might be uh, flawed. And, and there have been examples um, of practical attacks against de-identification where uh, researchers were able to re-identify data. Um, and so there are lots of examples. You may have heard of uh, the Netflix challenge uh, where the data that was anonymized and released by Netflix was uh, re-identified by linking it to data that is publicly available on IMDb. Um, there was also another uh, very good example of this happening in the 2018 Datathon from the government of Victoria in Australia, where they released data that had been anonymized to facilitate analysis of transit patterns in the city. And uh, researchers there again demonstrated that they could re-identify specific users as they traveled through, through the city. And so in, in the technical community, and by this I mean the computer science community and, and researchers working on privacy, de-identification has been abandoned for about a decade. And instead, people are uh, really working on techniques to provide differential privacy. And so... Uh, just earlier, I was sitting in the room and uh, Ninghui set up uh, my talk pretty well by giving a full introduction to differential privacy. So I will just only sort of capture the, the high-level intuition, which is to say that really here I've highlighted algorithm because this is really the change in paradigm that this definition is proposing is to say, well, rather than think about privacy at the level of the data set, let us think about the analysis that we're going to run on the data. 
And so differential privacy is essentially saying, well, if I have an adversary that's observing the analysis that I'm running on the data, they shouldn't be able to tell whether a particular individual's data record here in green was included in the data or was not included in the data here at the bottom. And so if they are not able to uh, distinguish these two scenarios based on observing the outputs of the analysis, then we, we say that the algorithm is differentially private. And in practice, what this corresponds to is uh, essentially uh, bounds on the probability of the algorithm making specific outputs. Okay, and so this is a definition, again, that changes the paradigm because we're no longer saying that a particular data set is, is private or not. We're now saying that the algorithm is privacy preserving, the analysis itself is privacy preserving. And so why do I think that differential privacy uh, is a, a much more interesting definition to reason about privacy than uh, approaches based on uh, de-identification? Well, you can see first that there are a lot of limitations from de-identification that are no longer an issue with differential privacy. So here, um, the first main limitation of de-identification is the assumptions it makes about adversaries. And so what I've listed here is examples where, for instance, if you use K anonymity, the value of K that you choose depends on what the adversary will know. And so you cannot decide on this value and then have robustness to new adversaries that uh, will arise in the future. Uh, instead, it, the differential privacy guarantee makes absolutely no, no assumptions about what this adversary here is aware of prior to interacting with the algorithm. And so this means that once we have demonstrated that an analysis is differentially private, it doesn't matter if the adversaries develop better techniques to attack the algorithms or if they gain additional information by uh, stealing other data sets uh, in the future, we will still have the same guarantee hold. Uh, and so this, this is, I think, perhaps the strongest advantage of differential privacy. There are other um, nice properties of this way of reasoning about privacy. Uh, one of them is that I just briefly mentioned that the way that we prove uh, that an algorithm is differentially private is by bounding uh, some of the probabilities that it is making uh, certain outputs. And so these, uh, these analysis give directly a metric on how much privacy is going to leak, uh, how much private information is going to leak from the algorithm in the worst case. And so this is a very nice uh, advantage in the sense that it allows us to compare different techniques and get a sense of which technique is leaking more information uh, in in the worst case. There are also other advantages, such as the fact that once an, an algorithm is differentially private, we can use its outputs and post-process these outputs arbitrarily and still retain the differential privacy guarantee, which is not true uh, when doing things like de-identification. It's also robust to composition, which means that if we have different algorithms operating on the same data set and each of these algorithms is differentially private, then we know that overall, the fact that we've run these different algorithms uh, also provides differential privacy. And uh, similarly, if an individual is part of a group, so for instance, we could imagine if we have uh, as a family all contributed to a particular data set, differential privacy allows us to reason about the privacy leakage at the level of a family in addition to the level of an individual, uh, which is again, very difficult to do with techniques that are based on de-identification. And so what, what does that mean for the user? Well, I think differential privacy in some sense is a very pessimistic perspective, but it's also very realistic for this reason. In, in some sense, it, it, it admits that we've already lost our privacy. There is a lot of information about each and every one of us on the internet. And so what we're trying to guarantee with differential privacy is that moving forward, if we participate in new data sets and in new analysis of these data sets, we are not losing more privacy than we've already lost. And so this is why sort of the differential aspect of the definition, this is why where it comes from. And so how, what does this mean in practice? Also, one of the very nice things about differential privacy, and this is actually a, what a lot of people in the research community are working on, is that it allows us to uh, apply modern forms of data analysis to data. 
Um, so for instance, we can, we can with differential privacy approach tasks like machine learning, uh, including modern forms of machine learning like deep learning. Uh, whereas if we use de-identification, we would have removed all the information that is useful for the machine learning analysis to learn and recognize patterns in the data. So to give you a very simple example, we came up with this approach here, which is uh, a sort of a voting mechanism to obtain differential privacy, where we don't have to change in any ways how the data is analyzed. We don't have to pre-process the data in any ways. All we are doing is taking the sensitive data and partitioning it in n subsets of data. So we now have n data sets and there is no overlap between these data sets. And then we repeat our analysis independently on each of these n data sets. And again, this analysis is the same analysis that we would have run otherwise without privacy. And the only modification we're going to make is here once we want to uh, reveal the output of this analysis in, the, in this example, reveal the predictions of a machine learning model trained on the data, where we're going to ask each of the models that we've trained on these n data sets to predict first. And then we're going to aggregate their predictions by asking them basically to vote for a particular prediction and only reveal the prediction that received the most number of votes. And so what this means is that now, if I participate in this data set, my data is only in one of these uh, subsets in one of these partitions. So it only influences one of the machine learning models among the N machine learning models that were trained. And so when someone is revealing the prediction at the aggregate level, my prediction has not overly influenced this aggregate predictions because essentially there were N minus one other models that predicted on this input as well. And we only reveal the aggregate prediction. And so I have less influence on the output of the analysis. And if we do this with a little bit of uh, randomness uh, integrated in the voting mechanism, then we can basically prove that this process is differentially private. And so what this means is that by participating in this data set, I'm enabling the machine learning application uh, without leaking too much information in the worst case about my own piece of data. So again, this, this was just to demonstrate why uh, we are very excited as a research community about differential privacy, because we can again scale to these modern forms of data analysis. Now I want to provide some commentary on the CPPA uh, that was mentioned before. And I should say that this, this, this is a sort of research that I do in collaboration with Lisa Austin at the University of Toronto and David Lee, also at the University of Toronto. And so our, our uh, sort of analysis is that there are a, a couple of limitations with the current proposal that again, go, go back to the fact that it relies heavily on this notion of de-identification, uh, which is defined here, I quoted, to modify personal information so that an individual cannot be directly identified from it, though a risk of the individual being identified remains. And so here there are several problems with, with this definition. The first one is that there is this distinction between direct and indirect identification that is not captured very well. And so while it, it might be possible to reason about direct risk of re-identification, the indirect risk of re-identification is not captured well. And this would happen, for instance, if the adversary gained access to additional information about the data set. There is another limitation, which is that the way that this is uh, sort of proposed to be implemented is that there, there are two ways that we uh, mitigate sort of this risk of re-identification. The first one is to say that re-identification is prohibited. But this, of course, assumes that the parties that would be attempting re-identification will follow the law. And so as soon as you have a rogue adversary, uh, a rogue internal uh, employee in your company, for instance, this will provide no guarantee uh, against the risk of re-identification. Whereas if you had used differential privacy, you would have uh, mitigated that risk as well. Um, similarly, there's a proportionality obligation, which is uh, estimating the risk of re-identification and adapting the countermeasures based to, the, to this risk. And here, there, this is something that we could possibly envision thinking about in uh, certain cases, but uh, even if we 
think about, for instance, direct re-identification, the minute that we include indirect re-identification, then having proportionality uh, obligations is just not practical. And so at the high level, I would say that the limitations are again, uh, essentially that we are reasoning about the data in, in terms of re-identification risk rather than focusing on the analysis of the data that is going to be performed. And so what this means is that it, it's, it's sort of, uh, sort of um, doubly troubling in the sense that first it fails to provide privacy because as I've explained at the beginning of the presentation, we have no way to estimate this risk of re-identification and how to define, for instance, the identifiers. And then the second problem is that it also prevents useful analysis of data. So if you imagine, for instance, an analyzing healthcare data with machine learning, it's just not possible because you're now removing all the features that would have been useful for the analysis. And so we're preventing these beneficial applications of data analysis uh, by providing data that is no longer informative. And, and even more so than just saying, why not just switch to differential privacy? I think that differential privacy and frameworks like differential privacy also have a potential to simplify the law. Um, and so for instance, I discussed very quickly um, the property of post-processing that comes with differential privacy, which is actually something that the law currently struggles to handle, sort of what people do once the data has been analyzed. And with differential privacy, this is simply no, no longer relevant because we know we have this post-processing uh, property. And so it would actually simplify uh, the law significantly. So to conclude, I will just say, if you remember one thing about this, this sort of long speech is, <laughs> is that you should reason about privacy at the le level of algorithms, not data. Thank you, Nicholas. And India, please go ahead. Great, thank you so much. Uh, wonderful following my colleagues. So um, I will share my screen now. Great, so Ian, I'm just asking you if you can see my slides. Yep. Okay, so um, I, I think that um, my coming last actually allows me to weave a lot of the um, issues which are brought up you know, by Nicholas from an academic perspective and also from my colleagues from the government from a policy aspect. And so uh, the title of my talk, and I'll start timing myself. The title of my top, uh, talk is, how to enhance innovation, um, uh, innovation and data protection through the Artificial Intelligence and Data Act. And so as Kelly uh, basically alluded to, um, we have um, Bill C-27 and the point about B still uh, Bill C-27 is that it succeeds Bill C-11, which died on the floor with the last parliament. So it's an entirely um, new bill. And one of the aspects of the bill is the Artificial Intelligence and Data Act, the AIDA. And it's entirely new law, which aims to regulate the development and the use of AI in Canada. And so with the implementation of the law, it's the federal government, which is basically responsible and has the mandate. So this is really exciting because Europe is still uh, working on its Artificial Intelligence Act. So. Um, we are being innovators in this space, and that's really good. When you look at the objective of the new act, when you look at the preamble of the bill, I mean, you know, the intents are pretty clear. It's supposed to enact rules which are intended to improve public trust of AI systems, and which is the one I'm going to focus on. And if you do that, you will stimulate innovation. You should. And the bill specifically mentions the relationship between um, digital and uh, between a digital and data-driven economy and leading to growth, but emphasizing public trust. And in terms of the administration of the act, um, it'll be ICED. My, my understanding is that it'll be ICED, which is responsible for administering the act. Of course, things might change because the bill is not law yet. So um, what are some key features of the proposed new legislation? And a lot of it was I've taken from a 
really great summary um, available from McCarthy Tetro, and I'll put the link out there. And so when you look at some key features, what the act, uh, what the act says, it's intended, it intends to protect Canadians by ensuring high impact AI systems are developed and deployed in a way that identifies, assesses and mitigates the risks of harm and bias. It also establishes an AI and data commissioner to support the Minister of Innovation, Science and Industry. And the key duties are to include monitoring company compliance and ordering third party audits. And where it's gone beyond, I think, previous privacy legislation and it's getting close to the European czar is that there's some very stiff penalties for non-compliance uh, of the act. But these are kind of some high level features because um, in terms of implementation, implementation is done through regulations. So the regulations still have to come. So when we talk about high impact AI, we're not sure what high impact actually means. You know, the, the devil is sort of in the details and they have to be clarified through regulation. But when you look at the bill, um, you know, in terms of governance, there are steps in the right direction. Um, and when I say steps in the right direction, there's clear indications of liability. So if you look at a system assessment, then whoever is responsible for an AI system, whether it's the private or public sector, um, has to assess whether it's a high impact system, right? And then there, if there's a high impact system, then there's a certain level of risk management. You have to be able to establish measures to identify, assess, and mitigate the risks of harm or biased output that could result from the use of the system. And again, this is something which, you know, from a societal perspective, it makes sense. We talk about bias, but of course, the definition of bias is not in the act. And there's a lot of ground to cover out there. And hopefully the regulations will do that. And in terms of monitoring, well, anyone uh, responsible for a high impact AI system. So when you say anyone, anyone, I guess the implication is that if there is um, a organization which has a high impact AI system, again, high impact to be determined what it means, then there should be an individual in that company who's a chief AI officer, who I guess will be responsible for these measures. Um, I'm not really going to be talking about system assessment, risk management, and monitoring. I want to talk about what um, the Act says and what the implications are in terms of data anonymization. So when you look specifically at the bill, it says, I know Nicholas will not be happy with this, <laughs> but it says in the AI Act that anyone carrying out a regulated activity and who processes or makes available for use anonymized data in the course of that activity must establish measures with respect to the manner in which the data is anonymized and the use or management of anonymized data, okay? So maybe in the terms use and management, there could be, uh, that's where you fit the algorithms in, but you see where the emphasis is, right? It's on uh, de-identification and, and, anon and anon anonymization. So in terms of the punishment, it's pretty steep. I mean, I'm just giving you one example of one punishment. So it's an offense for anyone to contravene their governance or transparency requirements. And if you look at the magnitude of the punishment, it's basically, with, it's akin to the European GDPR, right? It's, um, you, there can be fines of up to the greater of $10 million or 3% of gross, gross global revenue. So that's, that's quite a big amount, but there is discretion built into that. So that's what the AI Act is. So let's take a step back and uh, think that what are the steps to consider out here, right? And I think what I want to kind of really focus on is that, you know, we've been talking about say, uh, differential privacy. But I think we, what we have in society now is a lack of understanding of what can be done to anonymize data, right? And then kind of build trust in the process. And I'd argue that you need to kind of build up education and awareness on those concepts before you go on to, say, inculcating differential privacy 
in regulation. And I just want to be upfront. I absolutely support that. Absolutely support that. But we're not there yet. And I'll give you a case study to kind of suggest that. So uh, the Parliament of Canada conducted an inquiry on the use of mobility data from TELUS by the Public Health Agency of Canada. And the objective, and this is research I've done myself using Google mobility data, but the idea was to look at the uh, tracking population movements and see if there's a correlation between population movements and the spread of COVID-19 during the first wave of the pandemic. So obviously you'd use AI algorithms in this type of analysis. And one could argue that, you know, make the case that this is a project with a lot of significant public good and is innovative, right? So that's the type of AI analysis we want to encourage as a society. But what happened is that there were um, news reports plastered that the Public Health Agency of Canada took data from 33 million individual cell phones uh, without permission. And so the Public Health Agency of Canada apparently had access to all this individual level data. So um, that wasn't true. Like in a sense it is, they, get the, they did get the data from the 33 million individual cell phones, but the data were all aggregated and it was aggregated to geography. Now, based on my assessment of the transcripts, I'm looking at the parliamentary discussions, I don't think there was any danger of anyone being personally identified. It's no different from the Google mobility data, which has been released and is publicly accessible. It's all aggregated across many users in a certain geography. Now, there is an issue of uh, permission, and I haven't been able to determine that yet. You know, the, the idea was that, did TELUS really obtain permission from its individual subscribers that you know, in matters of crisis or importance, can we share your data if it's de and de -anonymized, it's, if it's anonymized, sorry, not de, if it's anonymized and aggregated. So, and that's important to build trust. So when you look at that, what is my policy recommendation? And I'm basing my policy recommendation on two pillars. One is to encourage innovation whether it's in public policy decision-making or by the private sector. And also kind of to reassure individuals um, from a trust perspective. So I do think that, I'm not sure, I mean, my colleagues from the government can comment, but with all this new bill coming up, is it very explicit that if a company is collecting data, there is a very kind of simple page out there saying if they're using I know that is part of the AI Act that you have to be transparent about how the data will be used, but is there also a very simple page which is mandated that, look, I don't want to be part of it, I'm opting out, right? That, that's, if you have that simple type of mechanism and opt out, then it builds trust, right? And then what happens is that you should also uh, definitely have an, oops, sorry about this. You should establish an AI advisory unit, an ombudsman. Because my point is that if people are struggling with the idea that with a lot of aggregation, the data are protected, you know, you need to have some reassurance from a third party, an established third party, like you have the Parliamentary Budgetary Office of Canada, or you have the Office of the Privacy Commissioner saying that, look, they're doing this, but we really don't have to have a parliamentary inquiry, right? Whatever methods they're doing, it's fine. Um, they followed the process, they did their due diligence, and the data are protected according to conventional methods. Because, you know, when you look at the act, there's a lot of implicit statistics out there and knowledge of data. And so there's this bridge between the legal tests and what you can do statistically that has to be you know, it, it, they have to be bridged, they have to be crossed somehow. And so I guess that's in the hands of regulation, but there's a lot of work to be done in that. And so I think that, you know, these are just some basic measures, some simple measures which I can recommend in the limited time I have, but I think they have the potential to improve public trust, right? I mean, if we want to be an ecosystem of 
AI, where we have these great companies, starts, startups coming up based on collection of data, right? I mean, people have to be willing to share this data and trust how it's being used. But this is also, you know, has to be accompanied by education and awareness. Like as academics, we do have a duty to better reach out to the public and say that here are some case studies, right? This is how data can be used. And in these instances, you don't have to worry. Because if that was there, my argument is we wouldn't have been having quite an expensive parliament inquiry asking about data and privacy when the data is really clearly aggregated and the understanding wasn't there. So I think that's all I wanted to raise and I hope these comments are useful as we progress in the development of this uh, important new act for the country. Thank you, Ian. Okay, thank you. All right, so um, in the interests of time, what I think we should do is just kind of combine the next two uh, sections so that we'll kind of just interleave questions among ourselves and questions from the audience. So if uh, whoever's in the room there with the portable mic can uh, start queuing up questions from the audience and just uh, let us know uh, uh, when uh, people have questions there, but I'll just uh, start off with my own questions while audience members are uh, getting ready. So uh, let me start with Kelly. So you talked about this uh, new tribunal that's um, proposed as part of uh, the new Bill C-27, um, and you mentioned that uh, the tribunal is intended to be like if if a company doesn't like the the uh, ruling of the OPC, they can go to this tribunal, which is meant to be uh, quicker and cheaper than going to the federal court. But is it instead of going to the federal court, or in addition? Like if they don't like the ruling of the tribunal, do they then go to the federal court anyway? And if so, doesn't that just lengthen the process? Well, the current process is that there is no middle ground. It's if you, if you disagree with the recommendations that are made, you have no other recourse but to go to that federal court, um, which is a very long, which can be a very long, very expensive process for businesses, especially smaller businesses. Um, and also for on our end as well, it can take a long time at that point to see changes. So if the ruling is in the OPC's favor, oh my God, that's adorable. <laughs> <laughs> Luna has a question. Uh, but you are not a cat. Uh, but it's, if, uh, you know, if the federal court uh, ruling is in our favor, it takes a lot of time then for businesses to actually enact changes. So this tribunal, what the intent of it is, is to streamline that process a little bit. Certainly the appeal process beyond that would be extended. Now, will that automatically mean you can go back to a federal court tribunal. It does depend on what ends up happening with these acts. These acts are still very young. Um, they have not been fully amended. There will be some amendments between now and when they come into force. So I don't wanna say definitively, this is what's going to happen. Um, but as it stands right now, there would be the additional appeal process. But um, with other, you know, with other departments, there is multi-step processes with appeals. So you have multiple recourses as opposed to just one uh, to appeal decisions. And that I, I think what that will do is you'll be able at least to have decisions a little bit sooner. Um, and also there's some additional elements of penalties that can be imposed that currently don't exist. So there are some stricter uh, penalties for non-compliance with the law, which I think will be, you know, it will be a good incentive for businesses to remain compliant with, with whatever the law is, whether it's PIPADAR, whether it's the CPPA. Right, and maybe just a quick follow-up on that very last point. Um, what about non-Canadian companies? Like we see lots of American and foreign companies um, doing not so great things with Canadians' personal data. Yeah. What recourse? Is there. So, so when we look at applicability of PIPADA, we don't look at whether your business is physically present in Canada. 
we look at, do you have a significant presence in Canada? So that means, are you collecting Canadians' personal information in a commercial context, regardless of where your home office is located? Um, and we've seen that with other businesses. We've done investigations on businesses, um, for example, Facebook, which is not physically present in Canada, but obviously collects and uses and discloses personal information of a significant number of Canadians. Um, and so when we look at that concept of, you know, it, whether the business is in Canada or not, uh, we look at more specifically, what is the information they're using? And if it's in a commercial context, then we often make that case that PIPEDA should apply. And I, I will tell you that most times uh, we've had agreement from the federal court on those challenges because, you know, we do a significant amount of research before we decide to go forward with an investigation. Great, thanks. Um, I'll throw it to the audience if there's a question from the audience. Just raise your hand. One question. Hi, thank you for the uh, for sharing all the knowledge. Um, I think my question is actually, uh, Ian already touched on it a little bit, but it seems to me uh, that the Privacy Act is a piece of legislation that's trying to locally govern an issue that is global in nature. So for example, once my data is collected as an individual, uh, it either makes money or saves money to, uh, to a business. Uh, so for instance, I know firsthand that some insurance companies would engage third party services from overseas to collect data about individuals in Canada and that data that they collect or purchase from them would influence their uh, insurance policy underwriting. So I'm not fully grasping how the act can effectively protect the Canadian citizen when the technologies used are not governed by any Canadian authority. I would love to hear your opinion on that. And that's probably going to go back to me. Uh, so first, a small distinction, the Privacy Act only deals with federal government departments. So Service Canada, CRA, CBSA, how those departments manage your personal information. So what we're talking about, if we're talking about insurance companies, would be PIPIDA. Now, PIPIDA, and because they are two different acts that say different things, it's important to have that distinction. Now, PIPIDA is technology neutral. So what that means is that you have a series of principles that are to be observed, but it's not specific to any particular technology, which means you take the technology and you figure out how those principles apply. Now, within PIPIDA, we do have regulations that state that if you are working, if an organization is working with a third party business, so if I'm uh, contracting part of my processing out to another country uh, or another, another country is storing information, that that business, the central business who controls the information is still required to make sure that there is a comparable level of protection of information. So that if your information is going from the insurance company to a third party enterprise, that that company is also contractually obligated uh, to have the same level of protection out of that information as if it were to remain in Canada. And that the organization that is the controlling organization should have mechanisms in place, again, contractually to do audits and to make sure that that is in fact happening. So third party businesses, in theory, should not be using information that they're receiving for processing for any other purpose other than what it was provided to them in the first place. Now, if that's not happening, um, regardless of the technology that's used, and certainly we have experts at the OPC who do a lot of analysis on different types of technology, um, that would be something to raise to our attention and for us to take a look at and investigate. Uh, but generally speaking, that's how the law would ap apply. And so we don't prohibit use of third parties. One, Customers should be aware that that's happening and that's something that we encourage businesses to put in their policies to make clear to clients when they're give before they give their personal information that this is the process that happens and this is where your information goes. Um, but also that the businesses are obligated to maintain that level of protection. Thanks. Um, I'll take the next question. Uh, oh, Lyle has a question. Yeah, I, I just uh, I just wanted to build off of what uh, Kelly was saying there. Like, I, 
you know, and actually linking back to the example you mentioned uh, to Anandia with respect to TELUS and the use of data. And I'll just point out that, um, again, like Cyber Center has worked with uh, telecommunications companies for, for a long time on looking at how they're protecting their systems. Um, and there's models of either carrot and stick here. So on the one hand, we're talking about legislation and how we can regulate the space, the use of data and this. There's also just the approach of, again, sort of building communities, understanding best practice. And one of the things we have done uh, in that space has been looking at supply chain integrity, for example. So understanding for big corporations, whether this tell us, whether that is, uh, you know, Canada Post or others, there's ways that we need to understand our complete supply chain when it comes to the technologies and the companies that we're using in terms of looking at the sensitivity of the technology they might be deploying, in terms of looking at the foreign ownership control and influence, for example, of some of your, your subcontracting elements, uh, third-party partners, et cetera, like that, that are using that data or helping you process some of it, um, and as well as the deployment of the particular technology within your organization. So it's one of the things we try to do is balance out. It's You can't regulate every space, but you can also try to infuse an understanding that there, there's ways to think through this, uh, there's ways to sort of entice. There's ways to share best practices. Um, it's not a perfect thing. You can't enforce it, but it, it's, a work, it's worked well for us in the telco space uh, in terms of uh, working collaboratively there. And at least it's just another element to consider. Um, so, yeah, not perfect. Just, just another maybe thing to consider there outside of regulatory bits. But how to incorporate, like you mentioned, Kelly, uh, building clauses into contracts encouraging businesses to, to engage in that type of thing, but through a thorough analysis of their supply chain issues that uh, 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 are, are, are right from that space. Great, thanks. Do we have another question from the audience? No, Ian, uh, that's it from the audience. Okay, let me uh, throw in uh, again. So Lyle, um, the kinds of attacks that um, we see, maybe not by like government threat actors, but just by like cyber criminals, as it were, um, are they more frequently against kind of stored data at companies or against individuals, either attacks against their devices or phishing and that kind of thing? Yeah, I think, you know, let me put it this way. People are lazy and you want the, the biggest bang for your buck. So I think the attractive targets are like the, the data sets, to be quite frank. So going after insurance companies, going after credit card companies, you know, going after banks and the like, because that's where you're going to get the best uh, bang for your bucks. From a cyber criminal perspective, 100%. You know, from a state actor perspective, they can take numerous ways of going about it. They'll want necessarily like masses of data on individuals, but it'd be specifically targeted information, for example, on a member of parliament or, you know, a significant uh, political figure or influential figure uh, within the, the, the Canadian government or private sector. And that, that's where you get more targeted pieces like, you know, spear phishing uh, uh, and that sort of thing, just target towards the individual. But for the cyber criminals, they want... Uh, a lot, they want it quick and they want to dump it and they want to sell it, right? So you're looking at that type of data. So that's at least sort of what we've observed. Um, but again, to gain access to that, that might be the, the end goal to gain access to that. The vector might be the individual, the poor practice that somebody employs in terms of their own, their own passwords, their own cyber hygiene and that. So gold might be the big data set, usually is, because there, there's a lot there to be sold and made from, but uh, sometimes it relies on the weaknesses, our laziness. I'm going to invest like we're lazy people when it comes to like cyber hygiene, we just are. Uh, and that is often the, the, the inroad to get to that data. Point, so. Thanks. And I want, I, I want to maybe talk to that last bit. We are lazy people, but I don't say that in a bad way. Like the, I'm not, I don't think we should be telling people the breach was your fault because you didn't choose good enough passwords or you didn't do this, right? The system was broken if it relied on people to be way more fastidious than they have any reasonable ability to be. And it is we as technologists that have made these 
horribly insecure systems um, for a long time uh, that really need to own up to this. Okay. Um, unfortunately, I think we're out of time. Uh, I would have loved to keep talking for a long, uh, a lot longer, but thank you all very much. Clap, clap, clap. And I will uh, pass the floor back to the in-person people for the closing. Thank you very much, Ian, and to the panel. Uh, so, yeah, let me turn this off because I know we echo.